This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Welcome to WE380, Stanford Computer Systems Lab for Colloquium. 2012-2013. I'm Andy Freeman. The other course organizer is Dennis Allison. We're approaching the end of the quarter, so please make sure you've done all your uh, lecture reviews by the end of dead week. It's easier to get them down now than then. <coughs> As many of you know, I'm a huge fan of sensors. I think sensors are really cool because it's the outside stuff bringing into the computer that gets us something to, useful to do besides just drive bits around a display. But today's talk is the other side, which is perhaps more interesting. Um, AI is often thought of in terms of so-called intellectual activities, playing chess, routing cars, that sort of stuff. But the bulk of our nervous system is dedicated to the lizard brain and below. And while we're very visual, a significant frac fraction of what we know comes, via, comes to us via touch. And our fastest reactions are actually in the touch world, not in visual or certainly not an intellectual. One surprising thing about this though is while touch is completely hardwired at some level, it can deal with situations that it couldn't possibly have imagined. I mean, how could we have evolved the ability to understand when a plane is about to stall by feeling feedback? I don't know about you, but I'm, you know, departed from the birds some time ago, and knowing when my, uh, something's about to stall through my hands just seems magic. But it's normal. Um, and this information is so important that we have to provide it to people. Today's speaker has had the good sense to be a mechanical engineer in a computer world to provide us that sort of feedback. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm Ken, I guess as you can free my, see from my slide. Um, you know, you mentioned something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is completely partly off topic, and that is the importance of sensory capabilities. Um, I've built a lot of robot hands whose job is to pick up things, perhaps stably pick them up, place them in places. And what I realize we've been neglecting is the sensory side of that. You know, I'm jealous of com computer scientists who can buy a camera and get megapixels per millisecond and crunch on that information to recognize objects, to recognize motion features, gestures, all, all kinds of things. So what's the robot hand equivalent of that? And that's something I'm embarking on, which I call the, the spider hand, and it, it, in that it, its job is to per perceive things by active uh, exploration. And I'm happy to throw whatever sensors we all can come up with, not just the traditional force and motion sensors. Tactile's kind of hard still. It's technically hard to get a fine array, and I don't think we need that um, in order to do interesting work in recognizing objects. Does this feel the same as that? Is this one of those? And so there's a whole array of things that I'd like to see people doing in robotic haptics um, that needs to be enabled by a r the right kind of sensory system, such as a hand, that, that whose job is to investigate the world rather than to manipulate it primarily, just to flip the game on its head. Okay, so haptics, there are several different versions of it. Let me do a little bit of um, nomenclature, and then I'm going to show you a little bit of a history of, of gadgets that people have tried to build, some of our own work. Uh, and then I'll show you some two different rendering techniques. As, t as much as in graphics, you do you do computational things to figure out how much light to put in a particular spot, um, to, and based based on a model of how things look, and then based on a rendering technique and your computational ability, you can get different qualities of visual rendering. So we also do haptic rendering, um, and so that's where we'll get to, and then maybe a few applications. So haptic comes from the Greek um, to take or, or to touch. Um, in the early days, it related to psychophysics, the study of human perception. And so haptics in the late 1800s began to relate to, can I perceive the difference between one texture and another texture? If I touch with two points on my finger, how close can they be um, until I realize or think that they're only, only one? So there's lots of perceptual things that have gone on in what we would call human haptics. Um, a little bit of nomenclature. Um, it's a little bit like acoustics, uh, haptics. Uh, you can have a haptic interface, an acoustic interface. Um, uh, there's some words I don't like, to hapticize something. <laughs> that, uh, I don't like that. And the word haptical kind of bothers me as well. Um, I, uh, I hapt I've, some of my dear colleagues call it a haptic. I call it a haptic interface. It's, it's a device. So that being said, um, this um, breakdown was 
may be obvious, was suggested to me by um, Madame Srinivasan at MIT, who was one of my partners uh, for 10 years when I was there. Um, so human haptics is what I just mentioned, study of human uh, perceptual capabilities and how we do it, what do we, how do we move and what do we feel. Um, machine haptics, which has the tendency to do more with robot hands than arms, and that's something I worked on for quite a while, still do, um, developing hands that can perceive material, uh, hold it stably, perhaps manipulate it into a different position, et cetera. And then computer haptics kind of parallels computer graphics, and that's where you have a model of an object uh, and a rendering algorithm and a piece of hardware that lets you, um, through that rendering algorithm, feel some attributes of that model. Uh, and then there are combinations of these. If you're doing tele-manipulation where I'm uh, diffusing a bomb you know, a couple hundred yards away, um, or more closely, more and quite commonly now, surgery, where the surgeon will have a control console with some very fancy control handles, and the patient will be not too far away, and there'll be much smaller instruments going into the patient that are highly mobile, and sometimes more than, more than two. There could be three or four, a camera plus a third arm. So the doctor can become small, kind of like Fantastic Voyage, and can do lots of precision work, they can scale down the motion. Um, so you can, you know, a heart valve being replaced looks like a, like a manhole on, on the screen, um, yet it's small and, and inside the heart. So there's lots of interesting things you can do when you start mapping human manipulation capability into smaller physical environments. Um, so common to the robot, tele-robotic world and the uh, computer haptics or simulation, simulated worlds is that the user interface has to be good. Uh, just like speakers, what, what are the quantities that matter in a speaker? Distortion, bandwidth, um, dynamic range and amplitude, whatever. There's lots of metrics, and there are similar metrics here. Uh, again, this may be obvious. Um, why is it, where does it occur? I mean, think about how many things you touch during the day, how much information you gather unconsciously. Even if you're just kind of walking around, around and you, you touch the chair, it kind of confirms that it's there, that it's mobile. I don't have to worry about it too much. It's not a piece of concrete. Um, the lots of things that we just touched, we're kind of constantly sucking in information by physical interactions. And it may be not just with our fingertips, but just our whole body. I know that there's something there. I didn't have to look at it to determine it. And I know something about its properties. It's not going to roll away. So if I need to lean on it. So I'm discovering lots of things by physically interacting with objects. Um, machine haptics, I'd still say robotic touch capability is very much in its primitive state. Um, um, you know, years ago when the Puma robots 20, 30 years ago, we're trying to put carburetors in boxes. They pretty much had simple force sensing. They bump into something. If, they, if it forces too large, it just shuts down. If it drops it, it doesn't, may not realize it dropped it, and it certainly doesn't know how to plan to go and get it. So we've got a, a long ways to go in sensing the state of things we manipulate, and then certainly a lot more to do in reacting autonomously to that. Um, one task one of our robots I want to have do is have it intentionally drop something and then based on some simple simplistic model of the physics how far that thing can bounce start looking for it and and if it can find it within a predicted circle then it can go and get it if it doesn't see it there then it realizes it, it can't get it so just sort of simple error recovery based on uh, multiple sensory inputs I think is one of the next steps uh, computer haptics uh, Again, is mostly what we're going to be talking about. Flight training, flight simulators are used. You know, you fly, a pilot flies hundreds of hours before they get and carry a, you know, a couple hundred people around in a plane. In surgery, um, there's this thing where they say, see one, do one. Um, you're, you're with your mentor, and you've never you know, pulled an ap appendix out of a live person. They say, OK, your turn. You do it. And so you or your family become their training grounds. And we'd like to be able to accomplish that in simulation. Um, Medical training for su surgery has been uh, a concept that's been around for a long time. I think we're just now beginning to be technically able to do it in a way that will have, posit will have real and positive training transfer uh, design. I'll show you some CAD environments where you can sculpt virtual clay. Uh, entertainment could show up in video games. Uh, so there are lots of different haptic interfaces, and I'm going to show you a bunch of them, some of my own, some of other ones. Um, and again, what do they do? They enable you to interact with a simulated object, a physical object. Um, exploits point contact. That's something we started when I was at MIT. And I'll explain a little bit more why that's a wonderful simplification of this, this job. Uh, you want to have good performance qualities, and I'll be talking about those as we go along. And you can go all the way from this device, um, where you stick your finger in a thimble, and it has three motors. So you can feel the x, y, and z forces. So if I touch a wall, it fights back. If I scrape along and there's texture, it starts inducing vibrations that tell me something about the texture. If there's friction, the force 
builds up and up and up until it lets me slip. So there are all kinds of interesting low-level things you can simulate, as well as high-level. Um, uh, this is a preview of rendering techniques. Uh, we've been able to render just using simple potential <coughs> functions where force is uh, directed against the, what, the negative of the gradient. Um, polyhedral surfaces are interesting because you can e express all kinds of different shapes. And uh, uh, implicit surfaces are my favorite one because they're um, differentiable and they're continuous and it's easy to tell a lot of things about it. Uh, and then volume representations, which we've gotten into for a uh, surgical world, where you take a, a scan, a CAT scan, MRI, um, and voxelize, you turn into three-dimensional pixels, um, and then you can have interactions with them where you can actually drill the bone. You can, we're beginning to be able to make it feel like you're actually drilling the bone by looking at the spectra of vibrations you get in a real bone drilling situation and modulate it um, with the speed of the drill. And they're, for right now we have fairly simple algorithms for removing voxels. We ablate them, we remove them uh, when there's a certain amount of force on them. So it's not a perfect cutting uh, paradigm. It's a big question, actually, to do successful training. How good does the simulator have to be? You may not have to be, you know, spot on with all the physics of it. There may be enough to get the, the cognitive and sensory motor skills transferred without excessive computation. That's a research question we, we deal with all the time. Um, some applications. Uh, this is a, a virtualized uh, clay modeling environment, digital clay. So this person using this haptic interface um, feels the shape of this seat that he, he or she is designing. And you have still available all the digital tools. You can zoom in and work on the detail. You can mirror things. You can soften them. You can um, uh, you know, have virtual sandpaper. You can have toothpaste so you can add material as well as subtract it. So it's a really interesting design environment. I'll show you some pieces of that, some versions of that. And as I mentioned, there have been haptic interfaces on remote surgical environments. Uh, this is from Computer Motion. I don't remember this. This is Phillips. This is a training environment. This is a mannequin. And so this person is training to do what looks like an ultrasound procedure, um, which is not too risky. You can, you can train for ultrasound without hurting anybody, but it lets them have um, show virtualized patients. They may have particular maladies that you won't run into in, in your everyday training. Um, this was a fun, fun thing we did at SIGGRAPH quite some years ago. Uh, we had a whole room full of people with haptic interfaces, and we gave them each a virtual blob of clay. And then the instructor told them how to do things with it. And maybe he modified it, put a hole in it, and then he handed out these virtual you know, eggs with holes in them and let people carve their name in them or do something with it. So it was a nice kind of one-to-many kind, kind of haptics that uh, could, could be a, a direction this could go. In medicine, you'd like to maybe take a, a virtualize you know, a particular case that you don't usually see and put it out to all the students and let them do a dissection of it, um, let them just look at it, let them palpate and feel the difference in feelings between a, uh, an elastic um, cyst versus a crunchy one, which might be cancerous. Um, and this was done by a, uh, probably one of the guys at Disney who does character design, and normally they work in clay, but here they were able to use a product from Sensible Technologies, a company that one of my students started, that um, lets them work in great detail on sculpting things. It's better at organic shapes like uh, characters, rings, shoes, and those, those industries have all picked this up to some degree. Another character. I think I'm going to skip that. So, so what are the ways that we communicate information haptically? Well, we've got various kinds of mechanoreceptors, little cells that are under the surface of our um, subcutaneous, under the surface of our skin. Um, as an engineer, I like to think of them as um, one kind senses DC forces, one senses uh, transient forces, uh, and one set of them is close to the surface and the other set is deeper into the surface. So four, four kinds of sensors. Um, density is much higher in the hand, uh, much less on the back and other places that aren't physically interacting. Um, so force and position, we have receptors also within our body to tell, you know, my muscles, I can tell how much force is going on them from, from two different sources. If it's a light force, I pick it up with my mechanoreceptors in my hand. If it's a heavy force, I start feeling it in my arm. If it's a really heavy force, then I start bringing in other sensors. So we have a multiplicity of sensors that can overlap each other in the ranges they can sense. Uh, vibration, thermal, electrical. We also have cells dedicated to pain. I, I'm not sure what we do with that. But. Um, and the important thing in haptics is it's not like vision where you can take a snapshot um, and then process the information. 
uh, even with vision, there's a certain amount of work. You know, we'll, we'll move around like this, especially if we have one eye to use parallax or other things besides vergence. But pretty much, it's a one-way information um, activity. Whereas with haptics, you have to do something to get the sensor to be stimulated. And there are lots of ways to uh, explore. You might simply enclose something and feel where it touches you. You might tap it. You might stroke it. Um, you might shake it back and forth to see if it's got a fluid in it or a viscous or inviscid fluid. So there's a lot of ex exploratory things that we do in order to stimulate our sensors. Um, and you can speak about it being sensory dominant. This is my spider hand idea, where the motion is in the service of stimulating the sensors and exploring. The AI part that I like about that is, well, I've told this is a laptop or a suitcase. I feel something there is consistent with either. What's the next thing I need to do uh, actively to disambiguate between the possibilities? I could just blindly slap around, but I would probably go and you know look for the texture of the leather if I heard, told it was one or one of two things. So, I, this this platform I'm hoping to develop, I, I think, will give rise to um, how do we say guided uh, exploration of objects, much as people do. And motor dominant is the other side, where I'm trying to move something, I want to put it over here. So mainly I'm thinking about where it is and where it's going to go, yet under the surface there's still some sensory information going on so I don't drop it and I recognize that it doesn't have sticky stuff on it or something that I need to pay attention to. Uh, so let's, let's talk for a minute about the device characteristics. In case you're going through the catalog and you want to buy one of these things, um, what do you care about? The degrees of freedom, which is the number of joints. Is it just a, a joystick that just goes fore and aft or left and right? Um, is it a steering wheel with one degree of freedom? Is it a, a pen that is connected to a mechanism that has full six degree of freedom feedback? So there's a number of motions that it has. And within that, how many active motions does it have? How many motors does it have? And then how many sensors does it have? You don't necessarily have to have the same numbers. Uh, for example, I could have a three degree of freedom linkage, which would provide force feedback to this pen. Um, <coughs> and then I could also track the orientation of the pen so that on the screen I would see my intention of orientation expressed, yet there's no torque feedback on it. Um, one of the emerging capabilities now, and we've got a pretty good device for doing this, is putting torque feedback on this handle, um, which complexity-wise adds, adds three more motors, which complexity goes up by n factorial in, in my world, so I worry about more joints. They better really be worth something if you're going to add it. And it does, and I, hopefully I can show you that. Uh, so force reflecting or not, there may, may or may not be motors in your joystick uh, for your video game. If there are motors, it can shake and give you certain kind of minimalist uh, effects. Um, uh, there are lots of tracking devices that you can wear on your hand, gloves, and you can kind of dance around, or the connects now that can follow your motions. There's no force feedback in those things, but it's, it's useful in some context to be able to track the human motion. Um, grounding, this is an area of debate. Um, should I wear an exoskeleton that is connected to a backpack that you know, will we'll fight back on my arm? Um, not clear, because I feel the reaction force, when I push on the wall, I feel the reaction forces on my back. Uh, is that um, confusing, confounding in some way? Or is it distributed so widely that I still feel like I'm hitting a, a hard wall? It would be really nice if we could just put backpacks on and have these virtual things on them. The, at the moment, what we f typically find is something that sits on the desk and has a, a linkage and a, a handle of some sort. And that's grounded so that the force, if you're trying to feel a virtual wall, it, the force is really going through the ground. And so it feels like it's, it's really there rather than kind of moving around with your body. Um, the sensing quality, certainly a resolution. Um, and when I talk about dynamic range, well, bandwidth counts, certainly. But when I talk about dynamic range, uh, in another sense, I'm talking about force dynamic range, the ratio of the maximum force <coughs> to the minimum force. And uh, in some sense, that's its ability, the, I don't know, the number of bits that it can communicate uh, of information. So I, I got my early uh, experience. In fact, when I was a very little kid. On the last point there. Yes, say, say again. Uh, question is, when you're talking about grounding in the backpack, what percentage of the backpack is powered for the exoskeleton as opposed to useful sensory equipment? Fair question. I mean, it, it is extra weight. I mean, you could have an umbilical to take care of the power thing. You know, I mean, a, a kind of simulation that the backpack guys would like to do is a special ops preparation where you're running around a building and opening the safe and squatting and doing this stuff. So in that environment where you've got an umbilical 
following you, you probably could do it. In time, with batteries, it might work. Again, there's still a question. Is that interesting enough to be worth the cost um, to do it? Um, there are lots of avenues where we just don't know if it's <coughs> going to bear fruit or not. Um, yeah, my earliest exposure to this field was in uh, visiting the Hanford nuclear plant. My dad was doing something there, and I was in the waiting room stacking blocks with this, this thing on the, on the left here. This is purely mechanical, so it's got actually r really great bandwidth. You could tap the, the table on the other side over here, and you'd feel the click, and it'd feel firm. If you tapped one of the wooden blocks, you could actually feel the difference, and that's pretty subtle difference. Um, but because it's a pure mechanical connection, cables and linkages, you get that really high bandwidth. As soon as you put motors, wires, and then motors on, on the other side, you start having more stability problems, and it's hard to get good fidelity stiffness between the two systems. You can do it, and you can add sensors to increase that in various ways. Sure. Uh, when I looked at that picture, I have no idea what I'm looking at. <laughs> I live and breathe this stuff. You mean, well, you don't get it? Um, so if, imagine you're, you've got uh, a radiation-proof window here looking into a hot cell, a, a lead-lined room, and you're trying to mix up some nasty radioactive stuff. So you have to get your hands in there some way. A glove box won't do it because radiation will, will get to you. Um, but in this case, you have the ability to get your remotely put your hands in another, in a, in a very hazardous environment and perform the work. So there's a handle that you stick your hand in here, and then there's some fingers on this end. It's, you know, pretty simple. It looks like pliers, and so it responds to, to your moving around. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. played one of those, too, over in the new chem lab at Lawrence Livermore. Okay. Day. Yeah. You, you play blocks, and what's truly amazing is it's just pulleys and cables. <coughs> really. Yeah. And they, they really distrust electronics. <laughs> because power goes out. You're, you're hosed. And so yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I'm kind of known to be obsessive with pulleys and cables um, for, for certain similar reasons. Um, they need to have more of those out for people to play, actually play with in hallways, like, you know, I mean, just, just students. Yeah, I think, you know, re re remotizing, no, enabling our hands to be remotely acting, I think, is a big deal. I mean, it's, it's certainly interesting, but there's a lot of usefulness, usefulness to it. And you can think about scaling down, as we're already doing in surgery. You can also think about scaling up, where you right. need to move big things around. You know, how do you map the dynamics of a cargo container down to a scale where I can still use my personal intuition to work with that? Good question. There's a lot of value in it, if you could. How long does it take you to pick up driving one of these things? <laughs> Two seconds? Or uh, it's pretty quick. Um, there was a scary <coughs> thing that happened with the surgeons, which was um, when we were doing our early human experiments, actually, at Intuitive Surgical. Uh, we'd bring in a surgeon who was very experienced with open surgery. So if something starts to bleed, they can go cauterize it or clamp it off. Um, with the tele-robot doing surgery, you're doing it through little holes, minimally invasively. And these guys just start cruising along, doing things without being really careful about cutting off the, the bleeders. And the thing that can happen is you've you get a red out, and the blood fills up, and you can no longer see what's going on, so you've got to convert to an open operation. So it's so easy, the point is it's so easy for those experienced folks to think, oh, great, I can just go on with my normal way, but there are a few other constraints you have to. So it is. Uh, intuitive is a pretty good choice of name for, for that company. Sir? Can you with the control um, communicate with the robotic arm through bodies uh, signal so that they can be separated? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, um, although mechanical s has the highest bandwidth, as we were speaking of, the typical surgical robot, all the ones I know, have el electronic connections between the two. Uh, sometimes you want to be in a further away room. There are also ways for a second surgeon to dial in, maybe with a low bandwidth connect connection, so they can at least point at things that you're doing. So you get this kind of interaction in a real world, but you're bringing in people from remote places. It's kind of a, it, it's like some of the online video games, only there's a real target. Especially when you're trying to have the arm pick up some hazardous uh, objects. I'm sorry? Oh, hazardous, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Like in the bomb disposal environment, you're not going to be pulling on cables like a, a marionette. You're going to be sitting in a, you know, a blast-proof uh, vehicle. Um, people's tolerance to complexity uh, amazes me sometimes. Um, uh, the one on the right here in particular is a hydraulic arm. Uh, again, th th this is the paradigm of we want to be able to pick up a you know, sledgehammer and smash cinder blocks. Um, that means it's not going to be able to put a key in a lock because it's getting good dynamic range. It can't control those little forces, not yet. And I think that's one of the important challenges. It's getting much better dynamic range um, in forces as well as other attributes. So, so this, this little brute on the right here um, could wield a, a sledgehammer. Um, 
uh, incredibly expensive. You're probably looking at quarter to half a million dollars worth of stuff there. Uh, fragile in some sense if you break it. And dangerous. The next picture shows this guy with a helmet on because if the uh, master spazzes out and goes for your face, you, you got to be careful of it. So, so there's a there's a lot of concern about this kind of haptic interface, teleoperator interface, where it actually has enough power to hurt you. Uh, more complexity, this thing on the right, uh, I don't know what they were thinking, but they have a master and a slave. The human's hand is buried in one of those things, and it controls the, the robot hand in the upper left of that picture. Um, so this is what I built um, for my master's degree, effectively. I was um, coached by a couple of really wonderful people at NASA to build a more generalized interface for their remote manipulators, such as the shuttle manipulator. And uh, although we didn't call this a haptic interface at the time, it, it really was. It had full six degree of freedom rotation and, uh, or translations and rotations total. And it was two-handed, which is really a big step up. You don't, how often do you really do things like this unless you have to? Um, more, much more often, we're manipulating things with two hands. Might one, one might be less dominant, the other one might be doing the task. Um, so this, st this setting it up with multiple hands was a, also a nice step. And some of the lessons I learned from a teleoperator designer, <coughs> um, Jean Vertu in France, who designed some of those early mechanical devices I showed, had to do with the friction, the inertia properties, um, uh, and other dynamic aspects. And I'll show you some pictures about that in a minute. People have done a lot of things like hand tracking, and I'm just <coughs> going to flash through these. This one, you wave your hand around, and it knows where your hand is. You wiggle it, and it's got sensors in your hand. No force feedback. Um, I, in fact, I tried. Um, I had a helmet on one time that showed a virtual menu up here, and the guy said, hit the top menu item, and I kind of swatted through it. I had no idea if, if it clicked or not, and did I hit the right one. There, there was, you know, there was no uh, confirmation uh, of it. Uh, and people have tried putting buzzers on the fingers, like page, pager motors, so when I go through it, it goes bzzz, but it's, it doesn't work. I'm not used to touching things and having them go buzz, except cell phones, <laughs> um, and that's weird. Um, I'm going to skip some of these. Uh, lots of hand tracking. There have been a lot of legal arguments about who invented which of these things. The ones on the left have pager motors on all the fingers on, on the, um, in hopes <laughs> that vibration would give you some um, <coughs> sense of what you were touching. The problem with pagers is it's not vector information. When I push on something, I get a force vector, and I know which way to go to unpush. If you vibrate something when you push it, it does not give me any information about which, which way to go. Unless I remember which way I was going to know how to back out, um, I don't know what the buzzing means, and, and I don't want to put a higher and higher cognitive load where people have to kind of remember what they're doing so they know how to interpret the sensor. It should be true on the face. Lots and lots of gadgets. It's been a quest for a long time. Um, these two devices attempt to give you force feedback on your fingers. Um, again, it, to me, it's a case of more complexity than fidelity. Um, I'm not sure anybody really did anything <coughs> useful with these devices as, as elegant as they might have been. Uh, games have force feedback devices. And again, tolerance to complexity. I, I don't know what this hand does. It sh shakes and heats your hand and tracks the motion. And, but again, it's kind of a one-trick pony. You can tell if you're holding a hot thing or a cold thing. It doesn't, it's premature. Um, so yeah, this is my, one of my mantras. Um, so, I'm going to skip ahead here for a second. Uh, let me touch on dynamic range once again. Uh, when people, so this is a, a log plot of the size of objects, <coughs> the size of motion or the, the motion r region domain that you might need to be working in to perform this kind of task. This task may be less motion. Uh, and then on the vertical axis, you've got the, uh, the range of forces necessary to perform the task. So your forces for doing electronic, for electronic assembly is about a decade here. Uh, you don't need to really push really hard, and you don't need to push really lightly. So it's about one, you know, one decade here. Um, we've got other tasks mapped out in here. This is kind of approximates from Lynette Jones, who's been a, a great psychophysicist at MIT. Um, but you can overlay on this the qu capabilities of, of the hand. Um, which you know, has a much larger dynamic range, um, one, two, three, three or four decades um, in terms of positioning capability, you know, large, small, really small. The same thing with forces. I can feel you know, really tiny forces, and I can also tell the difference between a, a, an eight-gallon can of water and a six-gallon can of water. So I can 
perceive d information at many different scales. So you've got the hand working in concert with the arm, working in concert with the body, and pretty soon you expand, you know, three, four, five decades of sensory capability, particularly force is the one that I'm interested in, so that I can feel a subtle, subtle thing, a little burr on the edge of a piece of material, but still feel the contour of a large shape. Um, we're good. Um, so going a little bit of history, but it's useful here. Uh, I did quite a bit of work with a force sensing fingertip on a robot. I wanted to see what could I do with a finger that could tap things and scrape things, kind of a fundamental question for me. Um, so I built a force sensing fingertip, actually Dave Brock, my student at the time, built it. Uh, pretty straightforward design. You've got a structure here with strain gauges in it that supports a, a cylinder with a spherical top on it. So it's a, a convex surface that up, and we can measure forces impinging on it in any direction. Just the net six numbers, um, not pressure distribution as you would with a tactile display. And we could do kind of blind palpation. We'd take a sphere, tap it. Every time you tap it, you know, if there's, you look at the force vector and assuming the friction's pretty low, you can associate uh, a tangent plane with that. So we tiled this surface just by poking around at it. Pre pretty basic stuff, but proof of concept. A little more interesting is when we started stroking uh, textured surfaces. So this is the raw magnitude of the force impinging on the fingertip. And you can see as you're stroking along, you're getting a lot of noise or some there's some information content in here. One of them, so then we do a frequency uh, plot of it, um, spectrogram, I guess. Um, and you can see there are little splashes of vibration. There's some lower frequency stuff that's going on here. There's probably 60 hertz noise in here someplace. But this is kind of like um, speech processing. And the, the student who did the, the processing of this work eventually went on to found a speech processing company. So the same idea of parsing information, um, detecting changes and trying to separate words from sentences, et cetera. It, there's a vocabulary for touch that we haven't fully articulated yet. Can I tell the, the friction in something? Well, actually, quite a bit I can tell. Um, this was a case where I'm moving in this direction and I'm measuring the ratio of the normal to the tangential force. So that's the coefficient kind of instantaneous coefficient of friction. And so as I'm sliding along, the finger has not st started slipping yet. I'm just kind of stretching the rubber covering on it. And so the force goes up and up and up. And, and then it starts to slip. So what we've seen here is the static coefficient of friction. And now as it starts, as fully developed sliding happens, then you get the, um, the Coulomb friction, the, uh, dyna the moving friction, dynamic friction. So we've kind of picked up a couple properties about this material. And again, this is stroking, so there's information in the, those vibrations, sometimes more or less depending on what material that you're stroking. So it gives you a way to either identify or select among project product, um, objects. Um, but maybe it's more general. You know, if I want to palpate an object and, and get lots of dimensions of information, you know, I can tap it to get the local impedance, I can stroke it, I can shake it, uh, I can feel the temperature, the, the heat flow. There are a lot of things that I could do. So this is why I'm moving towards kind of a generalized perception haptic device. So I just suck up all this data and see if I can see, is this the same as that? Well, in what ways? How close is it? Um, how close is the data um, uh, coalescing? And, okay. Um, Okay, uh, so let's say I want to simulate a virtual circle, and my, my haptic device has a couple motors in it, but some of those motors have friction in it, so it might be easier <coughs> to, to move this direction than it would be to move that direction. <coughs> um, so if I try to move in this direction, it's going to try to lead me along the easy direction. So it means I've got to compensate if I want to move in that direction, so I've got to kind of push this way, push this way, even though I'm moving this way. That's again adding to the cognitive load where you've got you know, bad things in your steering wheel and you've got to think about how hard to move it to get it to go where you want ahead of time. So in this particular case, um, this was in a tele-surgical context, the, the doctor could draw a circle like they want to be doing a, pushing a needle, a curved needle through, and at the robot end, it would do the wrong thing. It would slip along the easy to move axes and do something not nearly of the fidelity that the doctor would want. So this is where the control engineers come in, the mechanical guys stiffen up things, the control guys do some special dithering, and you eventually get a circle that makes a circle. So there's a, this is so multidisciplinary, it's, a, uh, it's exciting, not, not overwhelming. Um, so, for example, if you have friction, I won't bother you with the details, but if you have friction in this joint and this joint, so what we're, what we're looking at is a, a linkage that's fixed at the base, and it can go like this, and it can go like that. Um, 
So if your force is below some minimum level, no matter how, what direction you exert it, this thing won't move. So that's a little confusing. If it's, but if it's above some level, no matter what direction you push, it's going to move. So you have these kind of two extremes. Then in the middle, if the magnitude of your force is you know, larger than the small circle and smaller than the large circle, you don't know if it's going to move. It depends on the direction. So this gets to be really conf confounding. You find people with this kind of interface holding their hand with their other hand and just trying to force it into the position rather than smoothly navigating a, a force-dominated trajectory. Um, hysteresis. And these come up in lots of disciplines, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. But the idea of you move your master and the slave only goes when you push hard enough, and then it doesn't come back until you pull hard enough. Um, that's another bad mechanical property. <coughs> and this one I learned from, again, my friend Jean Vertude in France, um, which is the inertia of the thing you're moving actually matters. And it, if any of you looked at dynamics, the, the inertia ellipsoid for this is spherical. I've got the same inertia in all, all directions. So I kind of, you know, if I want to move diagonally, I'm not subject to any more extreme inertia than any other direction. But when you have a mechanism, um, the inertia ellipsoid changes radically. Like if I, I'm out here, okay, it's sort of reasonably like, same inertia in all directions. But if I get out to a more singular configuration, now the inertia going this way is very high, and the inertia this way is still relatively low. So that non-symmetrical inertia is another kind of, you've got to think ahead. Um, I want to go this direction, but it has less inertia that way, so it's going to drift that way. So now I have to compensate by pushing that way to get it to go that way. Um, so these are all things that disrupt the sense of presence, the um, facility, the ease with which you uh, navigate in, the, in these environments. Yeah? Yeah, so um, with the machine vision that can control the motion, uh, solve all these problems? Not at all. <laughs> so, so what's the problem you think you're solving? Um, because if you imagine how human draw a circle, yeah. uh, we constantly get feedback from our eye to make a circle perfect. Right. We don't really feel the initial or the friction or the asymmetrical the surface. Sure. We really use our, our vision to guide our, our motion. How do you know if you're touching the paper? Or if the pencil's broken? I mean, it, 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 your point is well taken. I mean, vision is used a lot to guide remote things, no, no question. But there are lots of cases where you need to know something about the mechanical properties of it. Uh, is it glued down? Is it not? Um, and then there's occlusion. If then something's behind something, y you don't know. Um, and the pencil example is kind of trivial. But so, no question, cameras can help. And in fact, for the telesurgery, the doctors <coughs> rely on very high quality vision. Um, in the case of the at least the current versions of the telesurgical robots, they don't get much force feedback. So in order to tell if they're pushing hard on something, they look at the visual information. So that's a case where vision really does come in and complement what, what they're doing. They, they have great mobility and precision control, and they got their own eyes to close the loop, like with the camera. So it goes both ways. Sir? So this inertia you're talking about, you're trying to mimic the inertia of an object? No, we haven't touched anything yet. Um, this, is, uh, this is an artifact of the interface. It's like if your speaker emphasize, you know, your equalizer was screwed up and so it emphasized the mid-range and attenuated the, the low range. That would con confuse you as to what you're hearing. Not, maybe not a good analogy, but this, um, as you're trying to move through free space, it doesn't feel, feel for like free space. It's got some personality that wants to kind of suck you into other directions than your intended direction. And that's just like the <coughs> a property of, for lack of a better description, like the gimbal or whatever you're working Yeah, the, the linkages, whatever the mechanical parts are, even the motors that create inertia in it. But that's something you could, in theory, make go away with the right kind of actuators? Or uh, that helps. You can buy very low inertia actuators. Um, you you like can make a counter inertia? You, you can actually put a force sensor on the wrist and compensate for that. Right. You can cut the inertia about in half before stability gets to be a, a real pain. So th th you can do some, yeah, you can fix the bad mechanics to some degree. I'm, I'm such a believer in getting the mechanics right, as right as you can from the first place so that you spend your energy on doing interesting things rather than compensating for the bad mechanical okay, design. So you want the lightest, least friction device possible. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering if you're going to cover hands specifically, because I, I know the Willow Garage hand Although it does have four sensors, it does have an embedded camera in what would be the forearm looking at the manipulator. Yeah. Uh, well, I won't go deeply into hands, but let me just touch on what you're talking about. Um, 
so w when we were designing the first version of that arm or that robot, um, it didn't have cameras on it, and right. we had the problem of occlusion. You're trying to grab something, but you can't really see. So, you know, it's pretty easy to stick a camera down there. And I'm no longer a purist. I'm willing to put whatever sensors wherever they they help. Um, we built a hand for DARPA for bomb disposal that has a camera right in the palm. And I, I really lean towards having them on the fingertips. So if I want to grab something and I want to find a, a crater, <laughs> a concavity that, to stick my finger in, and I have, want to find a good place to land to get a secure grasp, having vision on that, that end might, might be quite a help. And it's getting so cheap, and, as are accelerometers and other, other technologies. So uh, that's some very specific work. Yeah, go on. Well, that, that raises interesting questions about what we think of as with regard to touch as a sensor. I mean, we just generally call it touch. Sight has gone to the development. We realize sight is the retinas with cones and rods, of which cones are the only things that really distinguish color. Taste has, you know, sweet, sour, bitter, you know, depending on when it, whether you believe it, umami or you know, four or five senses. But yeah. the, the other senses we have, we don't have that kind of differentiation. Uh, you know, I mean, touch has. We can tell distinguish temperature versus pressure versus a bunch of other things, but uh, it's still not as nearly as well studied, don't you think? Well, yeah, but um, e even with touch, there, there are at least four different mechanoreceptors. So, so we're doing some um, pre-processing via mechanical design of the sensors. So you got at least four different streams of information coming from there. Temperature is a fifth one. Um, the load on on the the arm as well as the proprioception of where where you are. Yeah, have. Yeah. So, so there are and. I'm happy to put more in, you know, radiation sensors, chemical sensors, whatever I can fit in there to, to let me explore things and know as much as is possible about it. Um, and th all those pieces are coming, so I just want to have a delivery platform for, for them. So we can go on more about hands um, along the way if you choose. Um, uh, another thing, I want to get to applications and rendering pretty quick here, but I, I'm a hardware guy, so um, there are. There, these terms impedance and admittance apply in the mechanical world here. <coughs> so an impedance device, haptic interface, would have motors that have relatively low friction. So when I push the interface out of the way, the motor spins, it doesn't have a lot of friction, doesn't have a lot of inertia or re reflected inertia due to high gearing. Um, in fact, those of you that want to get maximum power transfer, you'd like to have impedance matching between the mass of this and the mass of the motor, so you get maximum power delivery. That's a tangent I can come back to. But the, the main point is the impedance haptic interfaces are pretty simplistic. You buy a good motor, you have a low friction transmission to it, um, keep the inertia down, and when you push it, it gets out of the way. Um, it doesn't have to do anything actively. Um, let me, I'm sorry to jump around slides here, but I want to go back to Um, the first, what we call the phantom haptic uh, interface, um, was at my suggestion or nudging, um, bu built by Thomas Massey, who was an undergrad at MIT with me at the time. Um, this illustration shows him feeling a, a virtual sphere, and he happened to put a light on it, so as he's moving around, um, on, the sur on the surface of this virtual sphere, we could track the light, and so it kind of makes a cool picture. Um, Thomas <coughs> is now, now a congressman, so he has moved on in life. Um, but one of, one of his three, three laws of haptics was that free space should feel free. You move around and you don't feel like you're in molasses or worse. Um, that constraints should feel rigid, so when you touch a wall, it should feel relatively stiff. What stiff means perceptually is a good question. Um, and is it, if it's a big room, what's stiff? If it's a tiny little ice cube that you're working <coughs> inside or sugar cube, what does stiff mean there that's perceptually a wall? I don't have an answer to that yet. And solid objects sh should persist. At some point, the motors are going to saturate. So you're pushing into a wall, it pushes back harder <coughs> and harder and harder, and then suddenly the motor sa saturates. It doesn't feel like a wall anymore, and the illusion just goes away. Um, okay. Uh, dynamic range. I've mentioned this quite a number of times. Well, the, the bottom line is your power source, your motor. Um, you've got a, a series of things. You've got the motor. Uh, you've got the ele electronic power coming in, which is pretty easy to get good uh, resolution in that. The motor's going to have impose some friction on this whole system. The brushes on the shaft are going to um, induce friction, bearings, and then there's a transmission and everything else downstream. Uh, a good human dynamic range is on the order of you know, four, maybe even five decades. So, so we've got an incredible span of ability to sense forces, which is, makes it possible for us to thread needles, do ear surgery, and you know, take cinder blocks. Um, 
a good motor, $400 motor from Maxon, maybe has about an 81, 80 to 1 range between the steady state torque and the friction torque. <coughs> that, that's a pretty good number. Um, the problem is when you start running it through mechanisms, um, the friction starts getting bad. Uh, a, a cheap motor from Mabuchi, they make it more than a billion of these a year, they cost 99 cents, uh, has a lot of friction. Its job is not to be a haptic interface, its job is to move, I don't know what, film through a camera in the old days. The Falcon is a $250 haptic interface that um, one of our students here developed into a company. It's still got pretty pretty poor dynamic range, but it's aimed at the game market. So if you're, you're whacking the opponent, you don't need a lot of difference in one whack or another whack. You basically feel like you hit the guy. Um, but I'd like to get this, you know, in a haptic interface up to a thousand to one. A decade improvement over what you can do now would be really nice. I'm not sure how to get there, but there are some ways. Uh, forgive me. Okay, so the opposite of the impedance system, which is naturally backdrivable, um, is the admittance system. So in this case, you have a motor with probably a big gear head on it, and if you try to push it, it doesn't go because you can't overcome the inertia and the fr reflected um, friction from that. Um, so it's like a stiff positioning device, very much like our standard industrial uh, robots, typically. Uh, so to make that work as a haptic interface, you've got to put a force sensor out here. You push on it, and it knows how to get out of the way. And if you've got a really good control <coughs> circuit, um, that can be fairly decent. Free space is never going to feel perfectly free, or as, w as free as the impedance device. However, hard surfaces can be incredibly hard because you can crank up the force or lock the motor down so it's as stiff as the, the mechanism at that point. Um, the, the more common of these, much more common, is the, the Phantom style or the um, uh, Delta style from Force Dimension. This is from Sensible Technologies. And both of these have motors that, their motors are fairly large, low, low gear reduction or low cable reduction for smoothness, um, but they're easy to move around, so you get that free space effect. The one on the lower right um, is an admittance device from the Moog Corporation, who has a long history of controlling hydraulics and very stiff, very fast moving things. So they put a force sensor out here, and they have motors of various sorts, electric motors, but highly geared with very smooth uh, ball screws and, and nice tight gears. And they've done dental simulations with that where you can feel as you're, uh, as you're cutting a tooth or a hard uh, bone, hard tissue, it really feels firm and it vibrates with, with good frequency. But that's a very expensive way to go, and, and my sense is in the long run, this kind of device is going to probably be the bulk of what people use. <coughs> uh, I'm going to skip the math here. I did mention maximum power transfer, and I, again, because I know some of you are, are double E's, um, the same thing applies in mechanics. If you can match the impedance of your motor to the impedance of your load that you're moving with the right choice of gear ratio, right <laughs> choice of transformer in electronic contacts, um, then the power that goes in is you're getting the maximum amount of power transferred to your load. What does that mean in this world? It means, well, maximum acceleration out here, so it's going to improve my bandwidth and getting, you know, as much um, bang for the buck out of the motors as, as you can. So transparency, again, all the things I've been talking about lead to the, the support the issue of transparency. I don't want it to be there. I'd like the wall to feel like a wall and not feel like there's a linkage that, that I'm dragging around. And so all the mechanical and other attributes that I've mentioned lead towards that. So now I'm going to shift to kinematics <coughs> a little bit. Um, this is really more what my background in, was in, uh, as well as mechanical design. Um, and this is a, a set of peg and hole tasks that kind of illustrate degrees of complexity you might run into in a haptic interface. Um, and although we can talk about degrees of freedom, you know, this, this thing has six degrees of freedom. I can rotate and translate. Um, however, if it's constrained, let's say it hits a plate now. Now it's, I've re reduced the freedoms, you know, X and Y, I can't move in, Z, I can't unless I disconnect. So <coughs> now, I, now I only have three degrees of freedom. Um, and these constraints can get greater and greater as you have more physical engagement. So if I wanted to simulate that process, how many motors do I need to, to do that? And when does it matter? I mean, if I'm only beating a drum, and it's an infinitely large drum, I only need one degree of freedom. So one motor and we're good to go. Um, but let's say I want to play a xylophone, virtual xylophone. Well, now I have to position not only vertically, but I got to get the x, y direction correct so that I hit the right note. Um, and you can go up into more and more complexity. Putting a sphere into a hole, I got to get x, y, z positions right. Doesn't matter with the orientation. So we can do all of these with uh, 
no more than three motors, and I can feel what's going on to the extent I need to. Um, and one of the insights in developing the, hand, the phantom haptic interface, which I've alluded to, uh, that Thomas built, um, is its, point, its interaction paradigm is that of a point. It assumes that you're pro probing the world with a point. And you might try this experiment at some time. Just close your eyes and go, go around and see what you can tell about the world by touching it with a point. There's a lot of stuff you can do with that. It's a little bit like ray tracing in graphics, so it takes a while to figure out what's there. That's why we need more fingers or more hands. But um, it's mechanically correct if you're modeling, if you've got a handle and uh, three motors that control the tip of the motor, that's just like having three motors connected to the tip of my, my probe. And so it's, 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 it's great because it's simple. You can get high bandwidth. You can sit on your desktop, and it's not going to rip your arm off. Um, so that's why we've been having a lot of fun with the, the Phantom Style haptic <coughs> interface. Now, if you want to start simulating, and again, these are abstractions. But um, let's say you want to simulate a peg in a hole, but now you've got some restrictions on it, or more restrictions, or a square peg in a square hole. In order to simulate those actions, you need more and more motors. So you can feel that you're jamming it in and, and feel the forces necessary to unjam as you're putting the peg in the hole and many variations. So this is sort of the pure kinematicians view of the world. Um, <coughs> we have doctors who do mastoidectomies. Um, we've been developing a simulator for them to train people how to drill a hole behind the ear here and get into the middle ear so they can do surgery on the <coughs> little bones, the stapes, the ossicles. Um, <coughs> and so typically, this is a fellow's named Dr. Blevins, who's a, a fabulous otologist. He'll, he'll, he'll make this hole in the side here, and then he's not going to just touch with the tip of his tool. He, he may be bracing on the edge here and using that to um, kind of scale down his motion as, as he changes the, bracing, changes the bracing around. The camera's too high. I should lower it down. Um, uh, so that's a six degree of freedom interaction. Thank you. Um, other cases might be if I'm wedging between I'm in a hole, and I'm wedging like this. If I only have the point force feedback, um, it's just going it's, it's to simulate whatever the point is doing, but I'm going to sweep through the bone here. So that's a, that's a bad thing to be doing when you're training somebody. If the doctor thinks, oh, I can just manoeuvre maneuver the point around, I don't have to worry about bumping into the blood vessels that are on the edge here, all that. So that's a case where you'd want um, more, more degrees of freedom, so you could simulate the actual contact. Uh, if you're doing non-medical things, there are lots of cases. If you're screwing something together, um, more than that, and there's some psychophysical testing yet to be done, um, it is six more channels of information. And so in a context where you need <coughs> more information, whether it's the medical things I've been describing or, or doing virtual assembly in a CAD system or just wanting, trying to perceive the fit between a teapot and a lid that you've virtualized, um, you need these more degrees of freedom. And so it's only in the last year that we've been able to render these more complicated contact situations and that we have six degree of freedom force feedback devices. And it's it's good. It's, it's really exciting. Um, let's talk about rendering. I'm going to give you maybe two or three simple cases. The, the obvious one would be if I'm moving my probe. Look, I'm over here with my real physical haptic <coughs> interface, but on the screen, I've got a uh, representation of my point. And if I push it past a boundary, I can detect that boundary crossing, and then I can start accumulating force by saying, uh, well, there's a virtual spring, and it pushes me out. Um, and that works pretty well. Collision detection is a trivial point on one side of the plane or the other. Um, and by varying the spring stiffness, you can make it feel squishy or you can make it feel hard. You can add viscosity in so it feels like molasses on a trampoline. Um, uh, so this is a cylinder, infinite cylinder coming out of the screen. So how should I render this thing? I guess I can look at the penetration distance into it, or, or as I just showed, or better, um, you can develop a p potential field, look at the gradient of it, and use that to um, dictate what the force should be. There's a problem with that, though. Uh, let's see, it's not. OK, well, let me back up. With the sphere, so it's, it's well defined as I'm pushing in that the force should increase this way. But when I get to the center, which way should it push? It doesn't know which way I came in, so it's going to pop me out the other side. That feels very <coughs> unrealistic. So there's no sense of state or no memory here of where I came from. And yet when I'm pushing on this table, there's no question what direction I came from because it's not going to let me go through it. So in, in the haptic rendering world, we need to keep track of where we first touched it so we know where to come back to as we're pulling out. Um, you could also use this potential field approach for simulating a cube. And this is in the sequence that we started playing with these things. Um, so you could have a, a field here that pushes you out, another one here that pushes you out that way. And that works pretty well as long as you don't go outside of your triangular uh, region. 
Um, but if you push down here and then suddenly you, you catch the, the forces pushing you out, again, it feels strange. You push in and it comes alive and pushes you out. Um, and then pops out. But, but is that a bug or a feature? Can you, can you learn to take advantage of that? <laughs> well, it's simple. Uh, it makes corners feel really sharp. Um, uh, further th than that, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, when I first showed this stuff to uh, some mathematicians, one of the guys said, can you like render a, a Klein bottle with this? Uh, I, we haven't done it yet, but because I, I think you have to have surfaces that are one way. Anyway, if one of you guys wants to help me with that, I'd be glad, glad to do that. Um, Dr. Dr. Cliff Stoll, he has KleinBottle.com. I mean, he makes a living off of it. Seriously? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just look at KleinBottle.com. He's given me three. That's great. All right. <laughs> um, so we said, well, can we, can we render polyhedral models? Because those are quite expressive. You can find them everywhere. You can make them. You can triangulize a, a, an arbitrary shape, almost. Um, so we began introducing the idea of what we call the God object, or there's a, a proxy. There are a bunch of names for this. But it basically, it's the thing that um, tracks uh, where you hit the surface. So it's, it's sort of analogous if I'm I've got two things. I've got the haptic device, which is trying to tell me where it wants to go, and then we've got the avatar who notices that I've that I've hit the wall, and it's not going to let the <coughs> avatar go through the wall. So I'm pulling along. I, can't, I don't have enough hands. Um, <laughs> you hit the wall and you stretch the spring. So the 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 haptic device continues on into the into the volume of the actual um, of the virtual thing that you're trying to fill. And now as you move around the the item on the, uh, <coughs> the avatar on the surface can, can track me. If there's friction, it won't move. If there is no friction, it'll follow me along. And I'll illustrate this in, in a moment. And then as I, even if I pull further, 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 it still knows I came in from this direction. So it's always going to supply the right restoring force to get me back out of that volume. <coughs> um, there are many tricks that, have, that come up, um, such as how do you simulate friction. It's quite doable. Um, uh, Garo shading, if you have something that's polyhedral, but you want to make it feel round or um, smooth surface, you can, you can uh, interpolate the surface normal so it feels round even though it's flat. Um, so this is just what I illustrated with my hands here. I'm moving into a surface, check for collision, no collision. Finally, there is collision. So I park my avatar on the surface and stretch my haptic device inwards, just as I il illustrated with the rubber band. Um, now, if I slide sideways, oops, doesn't really show it. Um, if it's a frictionless surface, and I'm, I pull into it and I move friction, it's, it's going to follow up. Um, if, it's a, if there's friction on this wall that I'm running into, I'm going to pull up, and it's not going to slide up. And it's not going to slide up until this force vector is enough to overcome the friction. We we'll call it a friction cone here. So if I'm pulling outside of the friction cone, then it will slide a little bit, and so it'll catch up with me to the extent friction allows it to check up. You with the camera back there are doing great as I'm flying around. Thank you. Um, and what, what's nice about this is it works with pretty, pretty complicated shapes. You know, you can have valleys, you can have uh, concavities. Um, and so as you collide with something like this, you slide along and the, um, the avatar slides down. And so now you can perceive that you're in a corner because I move back and forth. The, f the force vector does something very consistent with touching in a corner. If I move too much, then it slides up, so I know I've got a surface ne next to a corner. Uh, it, it's a very compelling um, sensation. And one of the first demos I do with people, I tell them to close their eyes. We have a virtual cube out there. And I say, move down until you touch it. Now tap it, and they feel that it's hard. Tell them, is it smooth? And they slide back and forth, and they feel smooth. This is all computational, and, and motors pushing back. And I say, go to the edge and find, find the edge. And immediately, they find an edge like you see on the, on the screen here, because they can tell it has the right force properties as they explore it. They don't, if they just touch, they don't know what's there. But again, because it's an active exploration modality, you can slide around. And then you can slide down in, into a, a corner and know that it's a corner. The only problem is if, if you're with this, is if your um, triangularized mesh is, is not watertight. Let's say somebody built the mesh and it's not watertight. And we discovered one thing that uh, was watertight when it shouldn't have been. Uh, some of you may know of the uh, Utah teapot classic geometry for showing off different kinds of rendering techniques. Um, so we built one and started feeling around in it. And it turns out there's no hole where the tea's supposed to go out. So you can't pour tea out of the, the Utah teapot. So <laughs> <laughs> just 
unexpected but kind of fun discovery. Um, my favorite one, as I mentioned, is uh, implicit surfaces. Um, I'm not sure how, quite how I got enamored with it, but this is probably my, my second f favorite paper that my students and I have put <coughs> together. You can express all kinds of interesting shapes. You can even do a sort of pseudo-constructive solid geometry with uh, implicit surfaces. <coughs> Some people have gone way beyond this and can con construct quite complicated surfaces. I haven't followed that. Um, the nice thing about an implicit surface, again, is you can write equations for it, um, and it's differentiable. So I can tell which, where the gradient is. Uh, what's also nice is I, testing whether I'm inside or outside of this is, is non-trivial, or it's trivial. You put in your coordinates, and if it's above zero, you're outside. If it's below zero, you're inside, or vice versa. Zero means you're on it. So you don't have to do the complicated kind of incremental search, did I cross or not, that is, is more typical of collision detection. And these are many, you can find millions of these kinds of objects on the web. Uh, interesting, um, whether they can become practical. Well, it turns out this algorithm shows up in some much more sophisticated algorithms. This so, sort of became the foundation of how you render complicated shapes and how you keep track of where you're touched on the surface. It's, you essentially have a tangent plane that's following around where you are, and so it's kind of a local model of, of your contacting, and you can take that up to higher dimensions. Um, so an ellipse, uh, again, this, is, this shows the, if, if the equation evaluates to <coughs> less than zero, you're inside, and, and so on. Um, so. Again, we, we just query the implicit equation. Uh, okay, so we have to keep, keep track. Okay, so we've, we've gone into the object, and before we realized it was crossing, the, the, um, the avatar is following along, but we've got to get this avatar out to the surface. So how do we, how do we get it out there? Well, it's just an incremental procedure where we follow the gradient. Right? At, at the surface, the gradient is normal to the surface. So it may kind of wander a little bit, but as you, if you integrate your way along, you'll eventually find your point on the surface. You have a normal that can be computed easily. And so now you've got a, a tangent plane, which is a local representation of where you touch this thing. Um, so you can play some tricks with the gradient to normalize it so that your steps uh, are well-behaved, let's say. Uh, and I won't go through the math in this. It's, it's fairly simple. It's an incremental technique, and you just stop moving uh, when your move, your termination criteria is when your move is very smaller than epsilon. There are other ways to terminate the algorithm. But um, what it establishes for you is the tangent plane. So I, I've entered here. I figured out where the tangent plane is. I'm down here. Now if I move to a new position inside the object, um, fric we're talking frictionless still, um, I have to figure out what the new tangent plane is. And so it's, once we've got the initial one, it's easy to, to drop down and find the, the new tangent plane. So this, this is a tracking algorithm. As I'm moving around, this tangent plane is following me around. Um, and if I pass outside of the tangent plane, then it says I've, I've broken contact with it. And lots of subtle questions, like how do you know when you broke contact? I'm, I'm not going to go through that. Um, so again, to summarize the implicit surface rendering, um, detection of contact is easy. Um, you do a little bit of uh, integration in the beginning to find out where you contacted, and then you, tr then you track the tangent plane as you move along, and that becomes the surface against which you reference your stretching of your spring that connects you to the, uh, to the avatar. Interesting questions. I don't, I don't want to go into this, but there are singularities, like the heart that I showed. Um, it has a singularity. I guess because it's quantized, it's not a perfect singularity. But you would think the equations would blow up, and I really didn't test this. But it turns out when you get into a little crevice like that, the forces start oscillating back and forth. It, it, a little limit cycle gets started. But on average, those forces are pointing out, and it feels like I've gotten into a crevice. And if I move along, I can feel the, the, the distance, the length of it. Maybe it's curved. And so that was just serendipity. I, uh, rendering implicit surfaces is a little bit of a pain. Um, uh, unless you want to ray trace it, which we can't do, not yet, in real time. Um, finally, I'm going to, I think finally, I, I'm going to touch on some of our medical simulation. Um, Dr. Blevins in the lower right is a otologist, very skilled, very experienced. And he's worked with us for quite a number of year, years to virtualize, first of all, the mastoidectomy process, procedure. Um, it's actually hard to find cadaver vo bones that are appropriate for testing this, um, for training this, rather. Um, it's a very, very delicate procedure because you've got blood vessels and you've got nerves, <coughs> um, facial nerve and a lot of things that you don't want to mess up with, yet you still have to gain access to the middle ear so that you can go in. These are the, uh, 
stapes, the ossicles, the, the three little bones <coughs> that connect your eardrum into your cochlea. And people have all sorts of problems that happen with these things. Injury, sometimes there are um, growths in here, benign or otherwise, <coughs> that destroy these. In fact, my son had, had a problem with these, a benign tumor in here, and so good old Dr. Blevins um, fixed it. He had, my son now has two titanium uh, prostheses in his ears, and he doesn't, <coughs> doesn't have to play the music so loud anymore, <coughs> sort of. Um, but the point is he wanted to train his residents to do this procedure in a virtualized world. <coughs> We're not yet to the point of training people and letting them work on, on live humans. We haven't gone through that level of, clinic of um, human subject studies, but that's, that's coming. Um, Sonny Chan, the upper left, is our <coughs> wizard software person who um, has recently come up with a six degree of freedom rendering technique. So putting <coughs> the pe pegs in holes is something that he's enabled. Uh, on the upper right is a sinus simulation. Uh, we're still working on the graphics, getting more photorealistic uh, rendering of the way tissue <coughs> looks. You have, you know, mucosa, water, uh, blood, and other things. And we, we'd like to get the visuals as, reali <coughs> visuals as realistic as possible because the doctors care a lot about that. Um, and also we want to get the mechanical properties. Even if we just had three things, you know, rigid as a bone, somewhat compliant because it's cartilage, and then very compliant because it's soft tissue, that would be enough to add a lot of realism to it. Um, <coughs> So the world of surgical simulation has evolved from thinking we're going to train people. That was 20 years ago. Problem with that was a high cost of capital equipment, and a med school can't really afford to buy a big machine to, to train people. At least that, those business models didn't work out. As time has gone on, though, these have, devices have gotten cheaper. And I think the good business model is for patient-specific rehearsal. Just as Im re insurance will reimburse you for a diagnostic scan so they know where to go to fix things. Um, if a doctor could rehearse the procedure, given your particular shape of tumors and nose cavities, um, the, the notion we have is that that will improve outcomes. And because it's incrementally, it's, it's beneficial to an individual, that then that should be insurance reimbursable. So, so our hope is that there is actually a business model here to, to improve health care. <laughs> Uh, on an incremental basis. I mean, this kind of stuff I'm talking about will fit on my laptop in five years, and my haptic interfaces, don't tell anybody, are going to fold out of my, my laptop so I can sit at my desk and practice my surgery and then do my email and then come back to practicing with the next patient. Question? From CT scan? Um, yeah, we use CT and MRI scans depending on, on what kind of tissue. So in some cases, uh, I don't have one here. We merged the two. Sorry? Like CT. What kind? I mean, it looks like CT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, again, we use both, and sometimes we re register the two together so that if you're, you know, need to go through bone, but there's a tumor inside, so you can c pick up the different kinds of tissue. Um, seg cleaning up and segmenting scans is is a real challenge, and that that's not our research domain. I'm kind of planning somebody else is going to take care of that, and there is a lot of work in sort of automated uh, segmenting of medical scans. Um, so the the top row is. Uh, actual photographs of a mastoidectomy, and then in the bottom <coughs> we have our virtualized version of it. Um, so you have some bone chips, and you have the shapes, and the sounds are, are pretty good. Uh, the visual rendering is not correct, so we have quite a ways to go in, in getting the tissue to look like tissue. Um, yeah, so I alluded to six degree of freedom rendering. So there's a case you know, I mentioned the wedging case or just perceiving something. Um, I mean, I could imagine if I had two six-degree <coughs> freedom haptic interfaces and I had a, a shape on this, virtual, a virtual shape hung on this one and a virtual shape hung on this one, I could intersect these two things and eventually figure out what the shapes of these objects were because I got enough information. If I only had point force information, it would be much more difficult or impossible <coughs> to discriminate between objects. So again, it's, it's more channels of, of information. So the algorithm that Sunny came up with allows us to, um, uh, I think we're representing one of the objects as a point cloud and the other one is a polyhedral object. But he can detect all the collisions here necessary to simulate hooking something and twisting it. So <coughs> you're, you're getting the forces in, uh, in all the directions that you would need to, to simulate um, interaction at this level of complexity. Um, on the haptic interface side, uh, well, we're moving beyond these, these kind of products, which are out to a six degree of freedom. Uh, device. This was developed by one of my former students, uh, Kurt Salisbury. Same last name, no, no relation, other than we like to design things. So this has six motors in it and is able to um, control the position and orientation of a, 
an instrument. It was designed for simulating cranial uh, maxillofacial surgery. It's one of the surgeons we work with. And so these, these two together are, uh, it feels to me spectacular. Um, uh, force reflecting grip, you know, we, we don't always poke things, we sometimes pick them up. And I think the ability to, to help to explore objects, not now with one point, but now with two points, where I can squeeze it, feel if it's soft, feel the size of it, feel the friction of it. I can get, to me, an order of magnitude more information because of the kinds of exploration I can do with two. And if I can do this with two hands, then I think we're really golden because now we can um, take material, feel it, feel the texture of it. I mean, most of what we do is with two hands, <coughs> um, and whether it's sculpting or putting things together or perceiving things. So um, that's the direction we're, we're, we're working in. Is getting everything to run fast enough and, and get it ergonomically designed so you can, can actually sit down at your desk and, and do this kind of work. Soft, tis to me, soft tissue simulation is not something that's our strong suit, although we're starting to do it because we want to give the doctors some realism in performing the more complete um, simulation of different surgeries where you have to remove the tissue before you can expose the, the bone that you need to get to. Um, many, many others are working on this. This is a you know for animation in, in films that's already done with compute farms. We need to do it in real time. And then finally, uh, a spin-out that I've got begun working with is with a, a humanitarian group in, in India who's trying to teach you know, the, the most poor people simple vocational skills. And it turns out some of the simple things <coughs> that we do with motors and s physical simulation can enable us to teach uh, manual skills, um, such as cutting, putting pipes together, a few simple things. I know cutting sounds like strange. Why don't you just buy some blades and some wood? Well, it turns out every nickel counts in this environment. And so if we can amortize a device less complex than this, <coughs> uh, over 100,000 or even 10,000 people, there's a good chance that you could actually use this to train people, get them a certificate, and now they make a dollar a day instead of a nickel. So it's an interesting offshoot. We have some other plans on developing resuscitation babies for, um, for chest compression for premature babies. It turns out a lot of babies die, particularly out in third world countries. They're not breathing when they're born, and just simple chest compression, as they teach over here in the Cape Center, um, could make a big difference. So we're looking at making a $10 thing that you hook up to a cell phone and you squeeze it and you learn the rate and the depth and you gain some confidence so that if you have a premature baby that needs it, um, you can help out. Whether that's going to fly or not, I don't know, but it's, I'm very interested in taking this high-tech stuff and, and spinning out some, some low-tech, sort of high, high value well, stuff. Why isn't that a scaled-down Recessa Annie? I, I think it is. I'm not familiar with Recessa Annie. Except that's I'm that's to make a completely plastic thing, mm -hmm. which you use for CPR training. So and it blows out if, you, if you're too vigorous. Yeah, you can you can do it mechanically pr pretty well. I, I don't I don't disagree. Um, the the fellow that's driving this is a uh, Dr. Halemic who runs the Cape Training, where they train <coughs> medical personnel to do this kind of CPR stuff, and and they use rubber babies to to do it, um, and it, so it can be done. But the the notion is, well, we'd like to track their behavior. You could just put sensors in it, but you could have different size of babies, different, um, yeah. you know, there's some parameters, and and the fact that you can do it for ten dollars worth of um, you know, a motor and a battery and a cell phone that they already have. Maybe that, you know. Th Plastic's maybe the cheap, though. The rubber baby's $2. So, so yeah, it, it, it's a question. It's an exploration <laughs> to see if there's, you know, value in tracking their progress. Um, well, there's value in tracking progress, but the. The, the way it feels, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I have no problem with doing it the simple way. I don't want to do it the hard way <laughs> if, if it doesn't make sense. So. Um, so I think that covers what I wanted. I, I didn't leave much time for questions, but I'm certainly <coughs> happy to. You can see the things I've said about what, what do I think is next, and it's kind of mom and apple pie, but I certainly want more fingers and, and more hands. I don't think we're going to get a Waldo or a Holodeck in any of our lifetimes or grandchildren's lifetimes. Could be surprised. But I, I think this kind of tool-based tool interaction is, is really a good way to go on this. It's tractable, and it uh, can be grown to be higher and higher performer. There's a path through getting great fidelity on this stuff. So, um, I'm open for questions or comments, thoughts. So, sure. so what fraction of operations in a hospital are done using this sort of technique? Um, <laughs> so, let's see. Yeah, I'm really talking about two things. <coughs> one is the simulation for training or planning, but the other one is the robotic surgery that you're talking about. And um, <coughs> the only one that I have good, you know, exp or exposure to was the intuitive surgical s system, um, and they've done thousands, if not tens of thousands, of procedures. They have about 2,000 of these machines out in the field now. Um, these are million-dollar robots. You've got a console where the guy sits at, and then you've got the robot over here at the, at the operating to table. Um, and so for the, for the hospital to 
make good on its investment, they have to do multiple procedures per day, and they, they are doing that. So my guess is we're looking at tens of thousands of operations. They, the company originally thought that uh, heart surgery, uh, cardiac bypass, would, would be the, the market, because instead of opening up the person, you could do it minimally invasively, because you would have enough dexterity. It didn't turn out to be a good market, because there are vessels on the back side of the heart and other things <coughs> that are hard to get to. But what was turned out to be a really useful um, application is um, radical prostatectomies, but that they can be done uh, minimally invasively. Um, and you know, in that operation, you want to be very careful about not damaging the nerves or the blood vessels. And because of the precision uh, that you can work with that robot, because it's scaling your motions down, um, that, that's been one of the, the big markets for them. There are other ones, they do like a surgery that takes 12 hours. Um, there was some facial surgery done recently that required a long time. And the doctor's sitting at a very comfortable place with a very good quality uh, visual image. And so there, there are other reasons besides the dexterity that this turns out. Then the ability to have a third arm, so instead of having a resident retracting, the doctor can kind of switch control to this arm, then say, you know, click it in place, and then go back to manipulating the other two. So there's, and then there's the fantasy, well, I could do surgery on the moon. Um, from here, time delay. And it, even though light goes fast, it's the buffering and the cost of a reliable channel and all those things. You're not going to be manipulating sharp tools at, at great distances because of the, I think, mainly the cost and the reliability. Other thoughts, questions? Okay, I think we're good. I'll hang up for a little bit afterwards in case people want to chat about it. <coughs> I think we're good for now. Thank you.